Hello, my name is Alicia Bai, and this summer I worked in the Lamardi lab to express and purify membrane proteins. Specifically, I worked with the small hydrophobic protein, known as the SH protein, of the respiratory syncytial virus, and also with the viral protein unique, known as VPU, of the human immunodeficiency virus, commonly known as HIV. For both of these viruses, we're looking at the membrane proteins, because membrane proteins make up the majority of drug development targets due to their importance in mediating and initiating viral mechanisms. So to begin, we inject E. coli cells with plasmids, which are circular pieces of DNA that code for a target protein. After allowing the cells to grow, we lyse them and filter out the impurities and cellular debris with immobilized metal affinity chromatography. Afterwards, we confirm that we've isolated our protein using native mass spectrometry and my lab's Unidex software. Unidex produces these mass spectra so that if you look at the tallest peak, known as the base peak, it gives you the mass of the most abundant protein in the solution. And because mass spectrometry is ultra sensitive, we can confirm if we've isolated our protein by seeing if the base peak mass equals the calculated target protein mass. So if you look on the left at the SH protein mass spectrum, you see that it has a base peak of 10,053 Daltons. However, we were looking for a mass of 10,128 Daltons, meaning that we were unable to isolate our SH protein. This could be because the SH protein is incredibly small, so we most likely lost it during purification. So in the future, we're thinking about redesigning its plasmid in order to give it more structural integrity during purification. However, if you look on the right at the VPU mass spectrum, you see that it has a base peak of 9,432 Daltons, which matches what we were looking for, meaning that we were able to isolate our VPU protein. So now, we can go on to study VPU structure, function, and its interactions with other biological molecules like lipids in hopes of ultimately designing a VPU inhibitory HIV vaccine. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adam Adir. I worked in Dr. On's lab over the course of the summer to study how the microbiome relates to overall human health, in this case specifically autism spectrum disorder. Now, the microbiome is related to a whole slew of different uh, diseases. This includes cardiovascular disease, digestive disease, and the focus of this study, psychological diseases. What we wanted to find out is if there was any correlation between autism spectrum disorder, the presence or absence of it, and the overall microbiome. To do this, we took a data set of 246 participants divided into two groups, an experimental ASD, or autism spectrum disorder having group, and a typical development TD group. And to perform this analysis, we used a tool known as KIME2, a plug-in software that generates statistical and taxonomic analyses that can overall generate uh, plots in richness, evenness, and microbiome diversity that can help with the further analysis. What we found as results in our first plot was that the richness in the ASD groups and the uh, both in the children and the mothers, was significantly higher than it was in the typical development control groups. What this means is that the overall diversity of the bacteria in the microbiome was significantly higher in our experimental ASD groups. In plot number two, when we uh, plotted the microbiome structure differences across all four of these experimental groups, we found significant clustering in both the blue and the orange, this being the ASD and ASD uh, mothers, compared to the TD and T uh, mothers, which are green and red. What this means is that there's statistically significant difference in microbiome structure among these four groups in that way. Finally, we wanted to analyze the relative abundance of bacterial genera across uh, all of these different samples and across these four groups. After following this analysis, we found 10 specific genera to be statistically significantly different in these four groups, which we then further classified into two main columns, this being the ASD children versus the TD children and the ASD mothers versus the TD mothers. We found three specific genera of note in that uh, analysis, this being the genera Bifidobacterium and the genus uh, Haemophilus, which are both significantly higher in ASD children and ASD mothers, and the genus Tirazella, which is significantly lower in ASD children and ASD mothers. Overall, these analyses indicate that there's significant difference in the microbiome compared to, in the ASD uh, experimental group compared to the TD uh, control group, which may be a point for further research to help further understand how autism spectrum disorder occurs. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lydia Baer, and this summer I worked in the multi-scale brain imaging lab of Dr. Elizabeth Hutchinson, which researches better imaging techniques for neurological disorders. My project focused on brains with Alzheimer's disease, which is a severe irreversible disease that affects memory and damages the microstructure as well as the coherency of the fibers in the brain. It is frequently misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, so research on the changes the brain undergoes can help identify imaging markers for early diagnosis. The goal of my project was to validate abnormalities seen in MRI scans of Alzheimer's patients using microscopy. We chose this method because diffusion tensor imaging tractography, the type of MRI that we used, shows the direction of water movement and microscopy shows the orientation of the fibers in the tissue. The direction of water movement depends on the alignment of the fibers, so correlations between them can validate the abnormalities seen in the MRI scans. My experimental method consisted of three main steps. I first optimized my methods using 
a part of a ferret brain to check the accuracy of my softwares and determine the ideal magnification on the microscope. I then took microscope images in six regions of interest in both healthy and Alzheimer's brains, and then I calculated the coherency values in both the MRI scans and the microscope images of the six regions of interest to hopefully find a pattern to validate those MRI abnormalities. We found that there is increased coherency in two of the six regions in the Alzheimer's brain due to the degradation of one of the two types of fibers that usually create a crossing pattern in a healthy brain. However, there was no significant correlation between the coherency values calculated from the MRI scans and the ones calculated from the microscopy images, which suggests that more specific diffusion MRI markers will be needed in order to accurately validate the MRI abnormalities. Thank you. Hello, my name is Madeline Berry, and this summer I worked in the Walker Lab to determine dog tick host preference to canine hair samples to see if there's any type of dog that are more susceptible to tick infestations. Um, brown dog ticks are the main vectors to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is the most deadliest tick-borne disease in the world. Um, this mainly affects indigenous and rural areas. Um, this becomes an issue when they don't have readily available vet and health care. Um, ticks infest homes, and there's no correct way to remove tick infestations. The Walker's lab goal is to create a trap that would be easier to remove tick infestations, and my goal is to see if certain houses are more susceptible to these infestations based on the dog breed that they own. The dogs that we tested were shepherds and beagles. The shepherds were chosen because shepherds are typically a dog that you'll find in these areas, and the beagles were chosen because past research lead us to believe that beagles are tick repulsive dog breeds. The way that we did this is we ran trials using petri dishes and we basically put ticks inside the petri dish in the two samples and we waited to see how the ticks reacted. We kept track every five minutes for 20 minutes trials to see where the ticks were at all times and we came to the result that shepherds at all time points uh, showed attraction towards the shepherd hair sample. So the ticks are attracted to shepherds. Rather than the beagle, only two time points did the ticks show any attraction towards the shepherds. But what was interesting when we did the choice host uh, test with the shepherds versus tick versus beagle, we found that the ticks don't have any significant preference towards either. Maybe a slight one towards shepherd, but nothing that would be important in the wild. We came to the conclusion that even though there is an attraction towards both, there is no repulses towards either. And in the wild, it's really, really matter when a tick is very hungry and it will go over towards any dog breed. Um, but the results were inconclusive. This information did, was very valuable to us because we could see that the ticks do have certain preferences towards dog breeds. And this can expand our knowledge on tick safety and tick behavior. Hello, my name is Nazi Bertram, and this summer I worked in the lab of Dr. Alicia Allen to study opioid use disorder, OUD, in pregnancy and the postpartum period. I specifically researched participant satisfaction by comparing participants with and without OUD in week one of a previous survey to determine the best ways to increase recruitment and retention of at-risk participants. Recruitment and retention of at-risk participants is extremely difficult, especially for our target population of postpartum women with opioid use disorder. This is for many reasons. Postpartum is an extremely difficult, chaotic time, so it can be difficult for a potential participant to be able to meet the demands of a study. Further, OUD and the stigma surrounding it can make it hard for a participant to come forward. And as moms with OUD, there's a lot of fear of legal consequences such as Child Protective Services involvement. To conduct our research, we analyzed data from previous satisfaction surveys from week one of a different study. To collect this data, we use the computer software REDCap to maintain confidentiality. We found that participants most value compensation and relationships with compassionate research staff. On the graph, you can see that items like burden to participate, annoyance with results, and um, difficulty completing questionnaires, they all correlate with uh, the overall experience with the study staff. So having a compassionate staff that is flexible and easy to work with is extremely central to overall participant satisfaction. Future researchers should take this into consideration when developing their studies so as to increase the recruitment and retention of their participants, thereby making their research more capable of making meaningful change in the community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dia Bhattacharya, and this summer I worked in the Koshi Lab where our central focus is researching a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. Toxoplasma is an intracellular parasite which has infected up to a third of the world's population and persists asymptomatically. However, in certain immunocompromised individuals, the parasite can have serious consequences such as brain inflammation. Currently, there is no 
cure for the chronic stage of infection, which makes us wonder how exactly is this parasite persisting in the brain. To study persistence, our lab has a mouse model which allows us to monitor toxoneuron interactions. Previous lab work done has shown that neurons interacting with toxo have lower firing potentials than uninfected neurons, which makes us ask, are these brain cells dying? My project focused on determining if apoptosis, a common mechanism of cell death, is being induced by the parasite in toxoplasma-injected neurons, which are commonly known as TINs. To answer this question, my project used two infected mouse models, one of which being caspase 3 knockout mice, a mouse model that stops apoptosis from occurring, and the other being wild-type mice, which act as our control. After sectioning the brains, we perform a cystain so we can clearly visualize toxoplasma and tins, which appear as green cells. Simultaneously, I performed a quantitative PCR, which allowed me to measure parasite genomes in the brains. Both of these approaches led to the similar conclusion that caspase 3 knockout brains had significantly more green cells and parasites compared to wild type, which suggests that apoptosis is being induced by the parasite in tins. This information allows our lab to learn more about the persistence of the parasite in the brain and to conduct further studies on this issue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kaya Bruckner, and this summer I worked in Dr. Abril's lab, where we focused on measuring per- and polyfluoral alkyl substances, also known as PFAS. The PFAS family consists of over 4,000 synthetic environmental contaminants, which may have adverse health effects. Although these compounds are found worldwide, they are not very well studied. In fact, only about 25 of the 4,000 plus PFAS are routinely measured in laboratories across the world, including here at the University of Arizona. One of our lab's main goals was to identify other prevalent PFAS within Arizona in order to expand the list of PFAS routinely measured here at the U of A. To do this, I used liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry to create chromatograms of the compounds we detected. I then used the measured retention time, molecular mass, and fragmentation spectrum to compare those to the online database. After that, this resulted in us finding perfluorohexane sulfonamide, or FHXSA, as a confidently identified compound within those samples. This identification of FHXSA is important because it means that we can now add it to the list of PFAS we routinely measure at the U of A which in turn means we can better analyze environmental samples and understand how PFAS impact us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Micah Burt. This summer I worked in Dr. Iwan McLeod's lab where we focused on synthesizing and modifying germanium nanoparticles for optical sensors and photonic devices. Um, we use sodium borohydride, sodium hydroxide, germanium oxide and quercetin. The sodium hydroxide was used as a solvent to dissolve the germanium oxide in, and sodium borohydride reduced the germanium oxide ions to nanoparticles, and we used quercetin to stabilize these particles from other reactions from happening. Um, we checked the size of these particles using dynamic light scattering and as well as the zeta potential. Once we determine the size and zeta potential, we are able to functionalize these particles by adding a functional group to their surface, which allows proteins to be immobilized on their surface. Our goal is to use these functionalized germanium nanoparticles to build nanostructures that are able to be applied to optical sensors, which will overall improve their efficiency due to germanium's high refractive index. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sophia Chen, and this summer I worked in the lab of Dr. Lafleur, looking at cognitive aging, specifically the transition from normal cognition to mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. Previous research has shown that cardiovascular disease is associated with cognitive decline, so I investigated whether taking cardiovascular medication provides a protective effect on the transition from normal cognition to MCI. For this project, I looked at a group of participants in the NACC dataset who are followed for at least five years. To examine trends in cardiovascular medication use, which are either beta blockers or statin drugs, I used McNamara's chi-square test to find time points where there was a statistically significant change in drug use, as indicated by a p-value less than or equal to 0.05. 
I also use logistic regression to test whether a history of cardiovascular disease impacts the association between medication use and transitioning to MCI. To examine pairwise trends for visits stratified by medication use and transition state, I created 40 paired 2x2 two two tables out of which only 5 had a significant change in drug use. All five time points fell into the group that did not transition to MCI and showed a common directionality of not using the drug to using the drug. This suggests that taking cardiovascular medication provides some sort of protective effect on cognitive decline. From the logistic regression, we found that the time a prescription was started for both beta blockers and statin drugs was not significant. However, a history of cardiovascular disease was highly significant in terms of transitioning to MCI. The results from logistic regression and McNamara's test suggest that medication use could be an area for future research. Another direction for future research is to tie the longitudinal aspect of transition state and drug use together. Thank you. Hello, my name is Annabelle Close, and this summer I worked in the Meredith Lab on the Rainwater Harvesting Project. So in this project, uh, we want to see how various avenues of water harvesting affect different properties of soil health. One year after a water harvesting system was installed at a single urban residence in Tucson, Arizona, the physiochemical properties of the soil were assessed. No significant divergence was found in these properties, but now, five years after installation, we're looking at these properties uh, to see if there has been any more significant divergence. So at this site, there are four treatment groups, the active basin, which receives uh, rooftop runoff water, the gray water basin, which receives used laundry water, uh, the passive basin, which receives incidental rain or rain that happens to just naturally fall, as well as the control, which is an unaltered landscape that also receives incidental rain. The properties we assessed were gravimetric water content, how much water is being stored in the soil, uh, bulk density, how compact the soil is, uh, uh, electrical conductivity, uh, which is a measure of salinity in the soil, as well as the pH. Um, so after our investigation, we found that there was in fact significant divergence uh, throughout most of these properties, um, and especially in the lower layers, which tells us that the irrigation is being done thoroughly and effectively. The effects also seem to be net positive for soil health, as they seem to be increasing infiltration as well as aggregate stability. Uh, through our research, we hope to help urban areas, especially arid urban areas, better conserve their water resources and support their plants Plant life. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Superiano Coronado, and over this summer I worked in the Tefili lab with my mentor Vivi, studying uh, slower growing microbes in the soil at Saguaro National Park to understand how our deserts are reacting to extreme climates. So what we were studying was slower growing microbes inside the soil at Saguaro National Park that often get outcompeted by the faster growing microbes. So what we did was we processed the soil from Saguaro National Park and the bacteria from the soil from Saguaro National Park to create an organic carbon soil and organic carbon bacteria to then add into a media to make it an amended media so that we would be able to culture these slower growing bacteria. So as you can see, uh, we have our amended media and our low nutrients media or our control. So our amended media, you can see that we got more colonies and more diversity compared to our low nutrients media. And what the Tefili lab is going to be focusing on now is studying these slower growing microbes that grew inside the amended media and actually like identify them and do more tests on them. So thank you. Hi, my name is Sahasrakshi Desika and this summer I worked in Dr. Lee's Applied Data Science Lab. My project evaluated the effectiveness of a new object segmentation program called Segment Anything. Object segmentation is the process in which an AI model is trained to be able to identify objects within an image by creating colored highlights over them. So what, in evaluating the effectiveness of this, we looked at two different factors, computational intensity as well as the overall accuracy of this model. So in order to do this, we processed about 30 images through the Segment Anything model, these images being in a variety of different locations and perspectives. And our results showed, first of all, it was not very computationally intensive. It didn't require a lot of memory, which makes it more user accessible. Second, in terms of the actual accuracy of it, we found that while the object segmentation program was able to identify those larger objects, such as trees or big bushes, 
Um, it struggled with those tinier objects such as tiny bushes that might blend into the ground or individual rocks, etc. But for our purposes, we're only going to be looking at the masks generated of those larger objects, such as those bushes, as well as saguaro cacti. And so we found that segment anything is viable for us to use to create masks. Um, we're going to use the masks that we generate through segment anything to train an AI model to be able to identify cacti within an image un completely unprompted and we're aiming to get this to be about 95 to 99% accurate at predicting whether there's a cactus or not within an image. Um, we chose Saguaro cacti because they have a very distinct shape as well as a distinct color and by using saguaros we can train the model a bit easier than using something that's a little bit more subtly different from the objects around it such as the plants and weeds that we're going to be using later. So once we've gotten the saguaro cacti um, identification to be that 95 to 99% accurate, we will then apply the same thing to plant and weed identification so that um, for the purpose of being able to um, protect the biodiversity as well as preserve the ecosystem in the Sonoran Desert. Thank you. Hi, I'm George Diaz and this summer I worked in Dr. Gandhi Leroy's lab where I analyzed electronic health records using Python, specifically regular expression in pandas. Over the course of the summer, I learned about computers, working in a professional setting, and most importantly, Valley Fever. I learned that Southern Arizona is endemic to Valley Fever with 80% of the residents that live near Valley Fever living in Southern Arizona. I also learned that immunodeficient people have a higher risk when they develop Valley Fever. This is because if you're immunodeficient, you have a higher risk of developing disseminated cocytosis, which is when cocy, the fungus that causes valley fever, spreads throughout your bloodstream, and infects other parts of the body. Lastly, the problem that my lab addressed was patient anxiety. Patient anxiety is a problem because many valley fever patients have symptoms related to pneumonia, which can lead doctors to mistake and misdiagnose valley fever for pneumonia and give their patients unneeded tests. We addressed this problem by analyzing the electronic health records with regular expression to find symptoms in the notes of the electronic health records that could better identify valley fever compared to pneumonia. Lastly, I want to talk about how electronic health records can help better healthcare. We can do this by solving problems like the one we did in our lab, but also by analyzing it to see how we can improve the patient experience. This can be done with regular expression but also just by looking through the electronic health records. Hello, my name is Lily Dobbins and I work in the Duca lab this summer. My lab focuses on how the bacteria in your gut, also known as the gut microbiota, impact host metabolism. Many gut brain signals are impacted by metabolites of the gut microbiota, and both the gut microbiota and its metabolites are highly influenced by diet. My lab specifically focuses on how the high fat diet affects these. The high-fat diet is also known to increase hypothalamic inflammation. The hypothalamus regulates metabolism and glucose homeostasis, so its inflammation causes weight gain and increased glucose levels. And one metabolite that is significantly reduced during high-fat diet feeding is indoles. Indoles are a metabolite of tryptophan, and they activate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, or AHR. In a healthy person, indole AHR signaling reduces inflammation. In a high-fat diet person, the lack of indoles allows for increased inflammatory signaling. So AHR may be one of the mechanisms by which a high-fat diet induces metabolic disease. My lab hypothesized that the increased rates of diabetes and obesity in high-fat diet fed mice were due to hypothalamic inflammation caused by reductions in indole AHR signaling. So to confirm this hypothesis, I used immunofluorescence to locate AHR in the brain, and then I used RNA scope to compare the inflammation levels of control in high-fat diet fed mice. As you can see from the increased red signaling in the high-fat diet mouse, a high-fat diet does increase hypothalamic inflammation. We were also able to determine that it affects both neurons and non-neuronal cells. However, the hypothesis requires further study. Studying gut-brain signals like AHR is important because they are promising targets for treatment of diabetes and obesity, which are dangerous, costly, and extremely common diseases. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ellie Dorland, and this summer I worked in Dr. Tyson Swetnam's Geoinformatics Lab. 
My project focused on the applications of artificial intelligence, or AI, on data analysis, specifically relating to the epidemics of COVID-19 and the cholera outbreak of 1854. My project aimed to use AI as a tool to help create heat maps that would identify areas of origin of disease based on concentration. Through my project, I used an application called ChatGPT to help me write my code, and I did this through a series of prompting. First, I would give it a role. I would say, you are a Python programmer, or you are a Python interpreter. Then, I would assign it an assignment. I would say, please write me code that'll generate a heat map based on this data, or please write me code that'll display this information on a Python heat map. Then, I would tell it how to export the information. I would say, please export this as a Python code block. Then, I would take that code block and publish it using GitHub. GitHub is an online platform that is aimed towards open science and code sharing. Within GitHub, I would use a program called Jupyter Notebooks to execute my code, and when I eventually had errors, I would run those errors through ChatGPT to help me find the issue and figure out how to solve it. After doing this many, many times, I was able to create multiple heat maps of COVID-19 and cholera, and I published both of those along with the code I had created on my GitHub website. That way my research can more better align with the ideas of open science. Throughout my project, I was able to take a process that would normally take a beginner programmer like me multiple months to create and shorten that time span to just a few months. This is instrumental in the sciences, but specifically in data science and data analysis, because it allows us to take processes that would normally take multiple months to complete and shorten that timeline significantly. This can help us to better respond to the results we are getting when we analyze data, and also help to create data sciences and data analysis and make them more effective and accessible to everyone. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Du, and this summer I worked in Dr. Capaldi's lab. I'm excited to share with you the focus of my research on understanding the molecular mechanisms of glycerol-induced protein kinase A, or PKA, activation in yeast. PKA plays a crucial role in cellular proliferation, in many uh, integral uh, numerous cellular pathways. Um, traditionally, it was believed that PKA could only be activated through glucose, uh, a fermentable carbon source, but actually it can be activated through uh, glycerol, a non-fermentable carbon source. Um, to delve in, into this subject, we focus on BCY1, the regulatory subunit of PKA. First, we made a modification of BCY1 and insert it into a vector. By doing this, we will um, see how this phosphorylates BCY1 and how this changes the impact of uh, PKA. Next, we uh, yeast transformed from the bacterial. Um, by doing this, we can actually see it through living cultures. Next, we performed assay with assays with glycerol media or starvation media in order to see the impact of these changes, as well as elucidate how glycerol um, impacts PKA activity. Um, our research holds the potential to unravel the intricate um, pathways of PKA activation, which holds um, intricate details on how um, kinases are activated, which have implications for human health and diseases such as cancer. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Dunn, and I spent my summer working in Dr. Elizabeth Hutchinson's lab, which focuses on studying promising new MRI techniques, specifically in relation to traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's disease. My project was about how can I validate MRIs of mice brains with traumatic brain injury treatment using microscopy, which is like examining the tissue with a microscope. So I looked at four different brain samples. There was a control, one with the traumatic brain injury, and then two more that had traumatic brain injury and treatment at different times. One had it earlier than the other. And so the treatment we were using was an ultrasound-based treatment, which has shown potential in the past to work as a treatment for traumatic brain injury, which is why we were examining it in the first place. So I looked at the orientation and coherency of white and gray matter in the brain and that's where I was looking specifically. On the pictures, the colored sections kind of show the orientation of the white and gray matter and the MRIs have a fiber orientation distribution overlay on top of them that also kind of shows the orientation and coherency in a different format. And so what I was looking at in that was kind of how together the fibers are and any differences in the injured side of the brain. And so what I found was that the brain that was given the treatment later was actually more effective than the brain that was given the treatment earlier when it came to comparing it to the control. So it didn't restore it to full value. It was about 80% in the gray matter compared to 
56% in the one that was given the treatment later. So there was significant difference there, but it didn't restore it fully. But that does show that if we are gonna be giving traumatic brain injury treatment in the form of ultrasounds to people in the future, it might be better to look at a later time of when to give the treatment than to give it right away. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leo Edgen, and I worked in Dr. Michael Brown's lab this summer. Our lab studies rhodopsin, which is a protein located in the retina, and is part of the G-protein coupled receptors family. Rhodopsin assists in low light vision, in part through its chromophore, retinol, which absorbs light and catalyzes the function of the protein. In doing this, retinol uh, changes from a dark to light state. Our question was how does the environment of light retinol affect its absorbance. In this case, environment would be residues around it and water. To do this, we took five models of increasing specificity that isolate the environment around retinol, and we modeled them in Pymol, and then we used Gaussian to run quantum mechanical calculations on them. And then finally, we visualized the results from the mechanical calculations on Gauss view. Our results returned two things. One was the UV visible spectrum, which allowed us to see the wavelength at which the absorbance for the models was the highest, and two, the orbitals involved in the electronic transitions at those peaks. We found that as we increased the specificity of the models, the absorbance peak converged on that of our experimental model, and that the Orbitals involved in those peaks nearly always existed around retinol. This is indicative of the validity of our model and also indicates that the environment of retinol does play a role in its absorbance. However, we do need to conduct more research. In the future, we plan to run these models with water in the vicinity of retinol and also run them with a flipped confirmation of retinol. Thank you. Hello, my name is Emma Edwards, and this summer I worked in the Sutfin lab, which focuses on the process of aging. For my specific experiment, I looked at how combined stressors, osmotic and heavy metal stress, impact C. elegans lifespan. C. elegans are microscopic worms, and they have extremely short lifespans, which is important for aging studies. Osmotic stress, which we induced through sodium chloride in this experiment, and heavy metal stress, which we induced through arsenic and cadmium chloride, are characteristics of many age-associated diseases and can cause cellular damage. To evaluate the effects of these stressors, we used a basic lifespan analysis as well as the application lightsaber. For the application lightsaber, we used the VP198 strain of C. elegans, which links GDPH1 expression to a fluorescent protein. GDPH1 expression is a part of the osmotic stress response in C. elegans, so the more the worms fluoresce, the greater the GDPH1 expression is. We are looking at how this expression is changed when we pretreat the worms with heavy metal versus osmotic stress individually. What we found was that worms that were pretreated with heavy metal versus those that were not did not exhibit a change in GDPH1 expression, meaning that heavy metal likely does not inhibit the stress response of GDPH1 expression in osmotic stress. However, what we did find in our lifespan analysis when we combined cadmium chloride and sodium chloride, which is an osmotic and heavy metal stress, was that they had an overall synergistic or greater than expected lifespan reduction. This means that the two stress responses likely interact in some way. This is important because humans encounter multiple simultaneous forms of stress at a time, especially as they age, and it increases with disease. This experiment helped us understand how an aging organism works to maintain cellular homeostasis, especially in the face of stress. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cameron Evans, and this summer I worked in Dr. Jennifer Andrews' lab, and I analyzed single-cell RNA expression in the skin of individuals with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a genetic connective tissue disorder that causes joint hypermobility, skin elasticity, and chronic pain. My lab took a three millimeter punch biopsy of non-sun exposed skin from individuals with HEDS and unaffected controls. The solid skin tissue is then disassociated into single cells with enzymes. The 10X droplet-based sequencing chemistry was used. The individual cells attached with the barcodes via microfluidics and each cell was processed separately. The data was then processed into a UMAP, where cells with similar transcriptional profiles get grouped together. Figure 1 is of a heat map, which allows for visualizing the expression of genes. It represents the top 10 genes with increased expression that distinguish one cell type from another where the gene is not expressed. Nine cell types were identified and further analysis is required to classify them.
Figure two is of a UMAP, which I talked about previously. The numbered categories and colors correspond with the number of cell cluster and color from the figure above. Figure three is of a permutation test, which compares cell proportions with conditions. There is a significantly less proportion of cell type zero, which is the light blue, of 27.1% versus 36.4%. On the other hand, there is a higher proportion of cell type six, which is the light orange, of 4.8% versus 3.6%. My lab successfully identified nine cell types and we found a differential in proportions in two of the cell types. RNA can be used to identify biomarkers that will distinguish an individual from a healthy control. Thank you. Hello, my name is Swinuja Gadasi and I worked in Dr. Michael Hammer's lab this summer. In the Hammer lab, we study a rare type of epilepsy caused by a mutation in a gene which codes for the NAV1.6 sodium channel. This mutation causes an influx of sodium in the brain, leading to hyperexcitability of neurons and seizures. To study this, we used a mouse model with and without the mutation. We conducted an RNA sequencing of the hippocampi of the mice and used the ingenuity pathway analysis software to determine that certain metabolic pathways were altered in females. For example, before a seizure, the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, or the production of ATP from glucose, was upregulated. Whereas after seizure, the insulin secretion pathway, or the transportation of glucose, was downregulated. And the tag degradation pathway, which involves the breakdown of lipids or fats, was upregulated. Using this information, I conducted a bioinformatics literature review. I propose that the reason females are able to alter their pathways in such a manner is because of their female-specific hormones such as estradiol and estrogen. Before a seizure, we hypothesized that estradiol acts as an antioxidant, allowing for increased capacity of oxidative phosphorylation so that they can make enough energy to sustain themselves throughout the seizure. After seizure, we proposed that estradiol and estrogen are activators of the gene that allows for translation of the protein to break down the lipids, which can then be used to make ketones and ATP. This all fits into our bigger model where we propose that females have a switch of energy source after seizures. We hypothesize that the increased oxidative phosphorylation before seizures leads to glucose depletion, leaving the mice to resort to using lipids as an alternative source of energy to rescue themselves. This model should be tested by measuring estradiol and estrogen levels in females, along with fluorescently tagging proteins involved in the lipid breakdown and ketone formation pathways. These findings can be significant because they support the shifting paradigm of the epilepsy field to include the study of metabolism. In addition, these findings can aid in finding more effective treatment for female patients across the globe. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Atharva Goel and this summer I worked in Dr. Nirav Merchant's lab. Dr. Merchant's lab aims to create scalable computational platforms in order to advocate for open science and open innovation. And this summer I worked on one such platform using the software of video segmentation. Video segmentation is a machine learning tool based on the subset of machine learning called deep learning. And what it does is it takes an input video and it segments the objects from that video from the rest of the video. Once it has segmented those objects, it tracks them throughout the video and then gives it back to the user. I researched many different video segmentation methods, such as Deep Lab Cut or Track Anything and YOLO. And then I created a decision matrix based on all of them as I tested different types of videos to see which method would interact well with which type of video. I created a decision matrix and then ranked each of these methods on a scale of one to five, with one being the worst and five being the best. In the end, I was left with three different methods, Deep Lab Cut, Track Anything, and YOLO V8. Once I was done with this, I started working on the data pipeline. This data pipeline would take as long of a video as the user would need, and then it would split them up into 10 or five second chunks. These chunks would then be segmented separately and processed on different cores in the CPU to allow for faster processing and parallel computing. Once this was done, they would all be merged together back into the video that the user inputted and given back to the user. I worked on this pipeline using SnakeMake and I'm still working on it, but with the success of this, researchers will be able to use it for faster and easier data analysis using video segmentation. This research has already been applied to Dr. Brian Carter's videos for pose estimation for dancers, and is also being applied to Dr. Hammer's research for seizure detection in mice. With the success of this pipeline, and as well as my research, it will be able to be applied to many different researchers' problems and help researchers conduct efficient data analysis in an easy way. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Julian, and this summer I worked in the Carnes lab at the College of Pharmacy studying how someone's genes affect how they respond to medication, which is classified as pharmacogenomics. The drug that we looked at was warfarin, which is an anticoagulant or blood thinner that is very commonly used, but some downsides to it are that it can cause adverse drug reactions, which can be fatal, or very, dosing generally varies greatly from patient to patient. Previous studies have found that genetic variants influence warfarin dosing. However, not many have looked at a specific genetic variant where a segment of DNA is either deleted or duplicated known as copy number variation or CNV for short. And so that's what my project was focused on looking at. And we wanted to look for copy numbers specifically in our region of interest on chromosome six. So we used extracted DNA from a Hispanic and Latina cohort, which was under warfarin. And we used their DNA for copy number analysis, where after we got results from copy color software, it showed that the copy number was um, how it was distributed among the samples and showed that it varied greatly, um, which was represented by the bar graphs. And we were hoping to use copy number at our region of interest to predict warfarin dosing, but after our calculations and our linear graph, we found that it can't, copy number alone at our region of interest can't be used alone to predict warfarin dosing. So some future direction or changes to build upon this project would be to look at other chromosomes potentially or increasing our sample size. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shreya Gagila, and this summer I worked in the Chapman lab looking at chaperone proteins, which are proteins that aid in proper protein folding, and they prevent protein aggregation, which could be toxic to the cells. Therefore, chaperone proteins are vital to the survival of our cells, but this means that cancer cells can also exploit them to their own advantage. Therefore, this summer, I looked at a specific group of chaperone proteins known as HSP70s, and I examined the characteristics of these proteins with the overarching goal of trying to find an inhibitor for HSP70s in cancer cells, which would serve as a viable strategy for anti-cancer therapy. In order to examine the characteristics of HSP70, for starters, HSP70 is found in seven different isoforms, and the basic structure includes a substrate binding domain, which is where the misfolded proteins come and bind to HSP70 in order to be refolded, and an extension of that substrate binding domain is known as the lid, which holds those client proteins in place. In order to further examine the characteristics of HSP70, I used a plasmid that has a gene to code for an isoform of HSP70 and transformed that into bacterial cells. I then lysed open the cells and purified out my protein of interest. I made versions of the isoforms with and without a lid and then examined the binding affinities of each to a peptide. The binding affinities tell me how well that peptide is able to bind to the substrate binding domain on HSP70. I saw that for most of the isoforms, the binding affinity was much higher when there was no lid present compared to when there was a lid present, except for one isoform, HSPA6, because the full version had a better binding affinity, but further research is needed to understand this phenomenon. But overall, I was able to conclude that the lid is interfering with the binding of other peptides to the substrate binding domain because of the better binding affinity when there was no lid present. This understanding can help aid future research in trying to find an inhibitor for HSP70 in cancer cells because we now further understand how HSP70 works and what affects the binding of other molecules to the full HSP70 protein. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ella Harris, and this summer I worked in the lab of Dr. Anna Dornhaus under the mentorship of Shannon McWaters to see if bumblebees prefer to do exploration versus exploitation. Exploration is when an animal or organism chooses to look for a new, unknown, or lesser known food source instead of continuing to use a known food source with a known reliability. For bumblebees, this would be looking for a different kind of flower color than what they're used to. On the other hand, exploitation is when an animal then chooses to continually use a known food source with a known reliability instead of looking for new ones. This summer, I had to start by tagging bees to find which ones are foragers, which is basically the bee whose job is to go out and collect nectar for the hive. Once I glued tiny little numbers onto their tiny little backs, I then found which ones were actively foraging using uh, these basically white flowers to you know see which ones were very curious, and then we put them into a sample phase. So this sample phase is where they learned more about one flower color than another. As you can see on my slide, this would be light green flowers where they learned more about than orange flowers. Each bee would then be put into two test phases where they would go through a Horizon 16 test phase with 16 fake flowers, 
and a Horizon 2 test phase with two picked flowers. These um, bees then were allowed to forage as they please, and I would be sitting there taking notes on which flowers they chose to forage from. I then put all of these numbers into a graph to see if there was any statistical difference on which flowers they chose. So though I saw a trend towards exploration, choosing to go to the lesser known flower versus the more known flower, my data was statistically insignificant because of my small sample size and um, having a p-value of 0.83 as my highest and 0.60 as my lowest p-value. So with further testing on the subject, we hope to find a similar pattern, but time is to tell if that will be the case. Hi, my name is Sam Hershey, and this summer I worked in Dr. Witte's medical imaging lab. My project was to demonstrate the ability of a hands-free photoacoustic and ultrasound skin imaging system to produce reliable data over time. Photoacoustic imaging is the process of using light to heat tissue, which causes the tissue to expand and produce sound waves, which you then create an image out of. This can provide much more detailed information about the material composition of the object than ultrasound alone. To show its abilities, I used two skin phantoms, one of which I designed in SOLIDWORKS and 3D printed. In it, I included three different tubes and placed three different types of materials within them to show the different abilities of the device. For example, in one I placed a dead bee as an example of a complex biological structure, in another small beads to show the resolution of the device, and in the third methylene blue gel to show the device can do multi-spectrum imaging. The other phantom was a small tube with various wires arranged in a V-shape to show it can do three-dimensional imaging. We took images of each phantom over the course of multiple days and then compared the data in MATLAB using a cross-correlation algorithm. What we found is that while the device cannot produce very reliable ultrasound data over time, it can produce reliable photoacoustic data over time. This is important because it shows the device can be used by medical professionals to study the development of skin diseases such as melanoma or other skin cancers over time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gina Horner and I worked in the Babs Costeca plant soil lab over the summer. Our lab is interested in phytostabilization, a remediation technique that uses plants to immobilize metals in contaminated soil, typically at past mines. These plants must be metal tolerant or metallophytes. Metal hypertolerance is the ability to tolerate extremely high concentrations of metals in soil. This results from local adaptation to environmental stress, meaning that different populations or groups of the same species sharing the same area can have different tolerance levels. Our model organism, Selenia vulgaris, is metallophyte. We looked at two populations, one from a copper mine in Morsburg, Germany, which is copper hypertolerant, and one from a lead and zinc mine in Plombier, Belgium, which is copper sensitive. We specifically looked at the gene SVHME52 and tried to determine if it is a casual factor of copper tolerance. The two populations were treated with varying concentrations of copper, 0.1 micromolar, 1 micromolar, and 20 micromolar, and DNA was then extracted and quantified from the roots. We found that the Morsberg population's DNA increased with copper treatments, whereas Plumbier increased and then dropped at 20 micromolar, showing that Morsberg thrived better in higher copper concentrations. We hope to perform reverse transcription quantitative PCR to relate the target gene to copper tolerance. If SVHMA52 is found to have this function, then the possibility of identifying similar genes in other plants that might have a similar function opens up. Copper is a highly toxic metal for both plants and people, and getting a better understanding of Selenia vulgaris's copper tolerance will advance the development of copper pollution mitigation. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Adrija Shimwe. I am in Dr. Voti lab in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Arizona. When proteins misfold, it causes diseases like Azemia's disease. Chaperone proteins like Goryeo, which is the bacterial version, and HB60, which is the human version, helps fold other proteins and also presents proteins from its folding. 
Our goal was to study how chaperone proteins Goriel tells help fold proteins. First, our methods were, first we grow our E. coli to express Goriel, and then we purify through these methods in the screen. And then we use NMR to collect data as peaks. The first gel you see on the left, there are like a lot of proteins in those red box. That means we need to purify more. On the bottom of that, we have the red box, which shows two proteins, two bands of the proteins, but we don't know if it's pure yet. So we use the native page gel to see if it's actually pure. And as you can see, it shows more details which proteins are more pure. And then we use that in NMR. As you can see on the NMR spectrum, we have the green peaks, which presents a white type Goriel, which is the Goriel with the tails, and muted Goriel is a Goriel without the tails. And those peaks present like there's more going on on white type Goriel, which means those green peaks could present the tails. And we hope in the future to study how those tails present, how those tails force proteins and we can do more research on that. And I'd like to thank everyone, my Dr. Voti for letting him be in the lab, and my mentors and my parents for their support. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zella Johnson. I was in Dr. Gronenberg's lab this summer. We worked on counting WASP neurons to hopefully fulfill more information about their neurobiological workings. So initially, we go out and catch wasps at Old Main Fountain here on campus. Then we would dissect their brains and then proceed to prepare them and section them out into very thin slices. After taking photos of those thin slices, we would then take it to Image J, which is a software that we would use for tracing to obtain the volume of the various brain sections. Then we would compile all those volumes, and I had to do it multiple times to ensure that all numbers were correct. Then we would take it to Photoshop and count the various cell bodies in the three brain regions that we used, which was the mushroom bodies, the antennal lobes, and the optic lobes. The measurements for the cell body volume and their areas were all very similar, yet when counting for the various cell bodies, the calyx resulted in around 4 million cell bodies, yet this process had to be redone multiple times due to human error. Meanwhile, the IF method, or the isotropic fractionator, we used a disassociative solution to break down the cells except their neurons, and we would make this brain soup so that we could use it to dye it so it could glow in the dark. Then we would take it to the microscope and count the individual neurons. This was a lot easier and would take up less time. I did two brains in a day. Meanwhile, the traditional method took me three days. The IF method has proven to be a better method when counting neurons, and we can apply that to future studies when trying to obtain more research into wasps. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eliza Khan, and this summer I worked in Dr. Kirsten Limison's lab, which investigates mechanisms of radiation-induced salivary gland damage. Currently, the standard of care for head and neck cancer patients entails surgery followed by radiotherapy, which often leads to permanent salivary gland damage and an overall diminished quality of life. The increased radiation exposure on the salivary glands leads to a dysfunctional wound healing response, which is comprised of three interlinked phases inflammation, proliferation, which is cell division, and differentiation, which is cell specialization. My project investigated whether modulating the inflammatory aspect of the wound healing response would help to restore salivary gland function. We were able to induce the inflammatory aspect with interleukin-6, or IL-6, which is a pro-inflammatory signaling protein. Previous research has shown that after radiation treatment, there is a decrease in signaling cells and immune cells, an increase in proliferation, and a lack of differentiation in the salivary glands. So I hypothesize that adding IL-6 to salivary gland tissue cultures would decrease proliferation and increase differentiation, both of which are directly correlated with better glandular function. In order to test this, we first dissected and sliced mice parotid salivary glands, which are the most radiosensitive type of salivary gland. 
After that, we irradiated the samples, added IL-6 a day later, and then employed immunofluorescence staining and imaging to visualize any changes in cell proliferation and differentiation. Our results partially supported our hypothesis, showing a statistical difference in differentiation but not proliferation after the addition of IL-6. This was indicated by the increase in green in the pictures on the third column as compared to the second, and by the 60% increase in differentiation as shown in the bottom graph. Our future research will explore the impact of different immune cells on the salivary glands wound healing response. So in conclusion, we saw that adding IL-6 to irradiated salivary gland tissue cultures increased differentiation, which is directly correlated with better glandular function. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrew King, and I've been working in Dr. Barton's biomedical engineering lab under the mentorship of Delara Long. This summer, I compared optical coherence tomography, or OCT imaging, which is a high-resolution optical imaging modality to histology, the study of tissue structures of the uterotubal junction. The uterotubal junction, or UTJ, is a transitional segment between the uterus and fallopian tubes, and my mentor and I have been examining the structural integrity of a normal human UTJ tissue sample. Now, the UTJ is important because it plays a protective role against the initiation of endometriosis, which is a disease where uterus tissue lining expands outside the uterus. In addition, the UTJ is also severely understudied. After staining section UTJ tissue, we were successfully able to identify the various layers and structural features of the tissue under a light microscope and OCT image analysis, thus giving us an insight into UTJ tissue morphology. Our results showed excellent agreement between OCT and histology. From the proximal UTJ near the uterus to the distal UTJ towards the fallopian tubes, we observed a shift from a tall columnar epithelium to a flattened epithelium, a thick inner longitudinal muscle layer to a thinner layer that eventually disappears, and a thin outer circular muscle layer that becomes more apparent distally. OCT provides volumetric microstructural information, which reflects transitional changes in the epithelium and muscle layers along the UTJ. This work is the first step towards advancing our current understanding of an important yet critically understudied segment of female anatomy by identifying microstructural features via histology and OCT image analysis that can be used as an endometriosis diagnostic. In future work, we will compare normal UTJ tissue to that of women with endometriosis to ultimately be able to identify the disease earlier on. Thank you. Hello, I'm Melissa Canies, and I was working in Dr. Melanie Culver's Ancient DNA Lab. During that time, we worked on non-invasively collecting the DNA of mountain gorillas by collecting their scat for DNA extraction. Now, this summer, we wanted to figure out what method of preservation worked best, whether that was RNA later, which is a liquid buffer, ethanol, or silica packets. Sadly, the silica packet samples molded before they were shipped, so we couldn't extract any DNA from them. But from the ethanol and RNA later samples, we extracted the DNA, which consisted of first lysing the cells or breaking them open, taking away all the solids, and then filtering out any proteins and enzymes that were left. Then we took the purified DNA and measured it in a fluorometer, which is a machine that measures the amount of DNA using light. The fluorometer showed us that the DNA samples from the RNA later had a lot more DNA than the samples from the ethanol, um, a difference about 100 folds. We also performed dielectrophoresis on the RNA later samples and found that the quality was very high because the, the samples had very long strands of DNA which stuck towards the top of the gel versus moving through the gel. We hope that in the future researchers can use this data to further research in uh, the conservation of mountain gorillas. Thank you. Hello, my name is Emma Kim and I'm working with the Yin Lab this summer. The Yin Lab focuses on Alzheimer's disease and its underlying mechanisms through analyzing altered metabolic pathways in the mitochondria. Studies in this area are becoming more important as Alzheimer's cases are increasing in the global population. Previous studies have established a relationship between cognitive decline and body mass loss in Alzheimer's patients, but the specific mechanism or the reason behind this phenomenon has not yet been found. 
So my specific research project focuses on the expression of three potential target genes, ATGL, UCP1, and COX-8B, to see whether their functions are related to Alzheimer's disease-related weight loss. So the first step of our experimental procedure was to confirm our disease mouse model or our 5XFAD mouse model to see whether the pathological changes detected in Alzheimer's disease development was present in that model. After confirming the disease had developed correctly, we moved on to a qPCR experiment or a real-time quantitative polymerase chain reaction experiment to detect the relative changes in the gene expression levels of the the three target genes, ATGL, UCP1, and COX-8B, in the wild type or the normal or the 5XFAD uh, disease mouse models. Our results showed that two of the genes, UCP1 and ATGL, showed a significantly higher expression level in the 5XFAD model than in the wild type model, implying that their functions in mitochondrial activity in energy expenditure and lipolysis did have a correlation to Alzheimer's related weight loss. Future preventive mechanisms could use these results to target the expression of these genes in order to uh, either rescue the cognitive function and uh, body mass of Alzheimer's patients and to uh, use in future treatment options for Alzheimer's as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jackie Kinman, and I'm working in Dr. David Harris's biorepository lab. We are trying to see if there's a genomic connection between the diagnosis of dysautonomia. Dysautonomia is an autoimmune disorder that is within your autonomic nervous system, or your ANS. Your ANS goes from head to toe throughout your entire body, and it affects your conscious and subconscious movements like breathing or blinking. There are four different types of dysautonomia. Um, familial, which is a genetic mutation within the Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. Idiopathic, which has no known cause. Uh, secondary, which is caused due to an underlying factor within the body, like a vaccine or a virus. And primary, which has no cause other than itself. Our methods were to research dysautonomia, create a survey based off of our research, and then give that survey to patients as we collect their saliva. Um, our future research entails finishing the survey and giving out the survey to patients, and finally, analyzing the survey data as well as their genomic data we gain from their saliva. This project is extremely important because there's little to no research done on dysautonomia, and this could improve diagnosis by allowing for a faster diagnosis as well as a less invasive one. This could also allow for possible treatment plans and overall better the health of people with dysautonomia. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katherine Lam, and this summer I interned under Dr. Ross Buchan studying amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. ALS is a neurodegenerative disease that causes progressive muscle weakness and fatal paralysis, and it's strongly associated with a toxic protein known as TDP43. TDP43 is present in healthy cells. However, its overproduction, or the failure to clear it effectively, can result in cell stress and ultimately death. So our goal this summer was to characterize genetic manipulations that can influence the level and toxicity of this protein. We utilized yeast model organisms missing one of three distinct genes, UBP1, which is involved in the removal of protein degradation signals, UBA4, which promotes specific protein tagging, and RCY1, which regulates intracellular transport. For each strain, after we induced TDP43 production using a plasmid or a piece of foreign DNA, we measured the strain's growth and survival rates. Then, using a technique known as Western blotting, we evaluated the relationship between TDP43 abundance and cytotoxicity. We found that deleting the genes UBP1 and UBA4 enhanced cell survival and proliferation, whereas deleting the gene RCY1 elevated cell death. Thus, the protein modifications associated with UBP1 and UBA4 may enhance TDP43 toxicity, whereas the intracellular transportation and remodeling pathways regulated by RCY1 may be disrupted in patients displaying ALS symptoms. Moving forward, we hope to more fully interrogate the roles of these genes and their broader biomolecular contexts in ALS, as these may present insights crucial to the prevention, management, and ultimately treatment of the disease. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Trinity Lee, and this summer I worked in Dr. Pascal Charest's lab. We worked toward creating phosphomutants of the cyclic AMP receptor protein called CAR1. We first needed a DNA construct, and this is just a segment of artificially designed DNA. And in this construct, we wanted it to consist of our target gene wild type CAR and our blue script plasmid. A plasmid is a circular piece of DNA found in bacteria. This construct serves as a template to carry out our mutation process later on. Um, we incorporated these plasmids into our host bacteria and then ran them through gel later to see if we had the correct band size to verify that we have the insert gene. However, we found ourselves unsuccessful because the gel either had no bands evident or bands of the incorrect size. We were looking for a band size of around 4,000 base pairs. So our next steps were to stop using the blue script plasmid and skip a step and move straight into using a larger DNA segment with wild type CAR. And we used site-directed mutagenesis to change a certain amino acids to create the mutations, and this was sent in for sequencing, and when it came back, it was successful. So our plan is to create more of these mutants and then express them in dictyostelium cells, which are our model organism, and then we will be analyzing their phenotypes. After we analyze their phenotypes, um, this will give us more information on how the phosphomutants of CAR1 impacts the signaling pathways in dictyostelium cells and how it impacts its migration towards certain substances like cyclic AMP. And in broader terms, this helps towards uh, us understand cellular function and it helps with cancer research and studies toward genetically modified drugs. Thank you. Hello, my name is Larissa Limissand, and this summer I worked in Dr. Jill Tardis' lab, which focuses on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or HCM. HCM is a prevalent cardiac disease that affects one in 500 people in the United States. A common manifestation of this disease is impaired relaxation of the heart muscle. This impairment inhibits the heart's ability to contract and spread oxygen to the rest of the body. My research focused on optimizing a drug screen that can identify a drug that mimics the phosphorylation of the protein cardiac troponin I, or TNI. Phosphorylation is a modification that changes the function of a protein. Specifically for TNI, this modification enhances the relaxation of the heart. Therefore, a drug that mimics this process could be used as a form of therapy for those impacted by HCM. We tested three fluorescent probes, IMBD, FMAL, and TAMRA, on two different regions of TNI, TNI A17C and TNI A28C, looking for the combination most sensitive to structural changes. We found that TNI A28C with the probe IMBD was the most consistent because the region is less flexible due to its distance from the end of the protein, and it had the greatest difference in lifetime fluorescence. Additional tests will be needed to ensure the reproducibility of our experiments, but the optimization of this drug screen will allow for the development of future therapeutic treatments for HCM. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shanae Lopez, and this summer I worked in Dr. Walti's lab in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Arizona. We study HSP60, which is a protein chaperone found in humans, and GROYL, which is its bacterial version, as well as Delta 526, which is our mutant of GROYL without tails. Both HSP60 and GROYL are 51% identical in their amino acid sequence. We know that in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, protein buildup occurs. So we are trying to study the role of HSP60 in Alzheimer's disease first through GROYL. To study GROYL, we're using a purification process as seen in the picture over the course of a week, as well as NMR, to examine our amino acids and eventually the function of the GROYL tails. On the left, we have gel images from a purification process and in our size exclusion and our ion exchange, the thicker bands that we see is how much protein we have. Where in our native gel of our size, size exclusion, we can see how pure our protein is. We were able to successfully obtain our 14 domain structure of GROYL. Afterwards, we then use our NMR spectras to use both wild type GROYL and Delta 526 to try and identify and assign our amino acids. I believe that I was able to assign eight amino acids into our wild type sequence. We can now use this information to begin to study the role of HSP60. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Adrian Matskin, and this summer I worked with Dr. Riley and his lab that focuses on mosquito transmitted diseases. In the lab, we work specifically with Aedes aegypti, which is a big carrier with um, for Zika and Dengue, which are viruses that affect human health across the world. My project aims to identify which mosquitoes are potentially infectious and the whole gains of mosquito control organizations to effectively target and eliminate those mosquitoes. So my project specifically was using NIRS, which stands for Near Infrared Spectrometry, in order to see there's a correlation between that spectra and uh, the number of blood meals. NIRS is just simply firing a laser into the exoskeleton of a mosquito and seeing the, the, how the light reflects back. And understanding blood meals is really important for mosquito transmitted diseases because mosquitoes that have one or fewer um, blood meals are incapable of transmitting diseases such as malaria and dengue. And mosquitoes have two or more are at higher risk. And mosquitoes that have much more are even more. So <clears throat> what we found with my project is that there's a pretty strong correlation between the NIRS signature and the number of blood meals. And this is really important because now um, mosquito control efforts can now just go and sample different mosquito populations <clears throat> and target the mosquitoes with a high blood meal count to more effectively protect the communities that they serve. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ria Nala and I worked in Dr. Gandhi Lira's lab this summer focusing on valley fever. Valley fever is a condition endemic to the southwestern United States that's caused by inhalation of fungal spores in dirt. And despite being around 50,000 cases per year in endemic regions, it is often misdiagnosed with pneumonia and other respiratory conditions. In order to prevent this misdiagnosis and cause earlier diagnosis, I worked in Python to analyze electronic health records relating to valley fever and pneumonia patient data sets. Using regular expressions in Python, which are essentially word coders um, and matching symbols, I analyzed the different symptoms and their synonyms in these electronic health records to see if there's any distinctions between valley fever and pneumonia. My results found that there were some significant differences between valley fever and pneumonia for certain symptoms. For example, night sweats, fatigue, congestion, and more. Night sweats had the most significant difference with around 17% higher for valley fever. This shows that there are some physiological differences between pneumonia and valley fever that probably need to be further investigated. Additionally, doctors can use this research to better distinguish between pneumonia and valley fever in the future and properly prescribe valley fever in the future. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ria Nadapanani, and this summer I worked in Dr. Nancy Horton's lab. I studied the human parvovirus B19, a pathogenic virus that severely affects immunocompromised people. Our goal with this project was to isolate the virus's NS1 nucleus domain that's responsible for viral replication and bind it to a synthetic compound that could hopefully inhibit the cleavage activity of the domain. With this compound, we hope to use it to mitigate the negative effects of B19 for those affected by it. This summer, I worked on purification. We first started by growing E. coli cells that we transformed a plaid containing genes for expression of the NS1 nuclease domain and ampicillin resistance. Then we moved on to purification techniques such as batch purification with talon or cobalt resin and anion exchange column chromatography, or DEAE. We then moved on to concentrating with different buffers and dialyzing. For, as for our results, when we started with DEAE run one, our graph only has one peak, which means that we did not segregate our protein from our contaminants. We did a Kamasi stain to run our results and saw that we still had two to three contaminants left. Once we changed the pH of our buffers and troubleshooted our gradient and moved on to DEAE run four, we see that we have multiple peaks, meaning that our protein and our contaminants fell off at different places. This means that we successfully segregated our protein from our contaminants. We also tested this with the Kamasi stain, which showed that we still had one to two contaminants left depending on the fraction that we collected. Following this, we moved on to concentrating, in which we used techniques such as western blotting and Kamasi stain to see if we successfully concentrated our protein. From before and after, we did concentrate our protein. However, we did also concentrate some contaminants. This means that future directions entail size exclusion chromatography to get rid of our last contaminants, as well as trials to determine the best conditions for crystallization. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bernardo Navarro, and this summer I worked in Dr. Lett's Bone Viscoelasticity Lab. 
Now this is regarding a specific type of surgery called bone fusion, in which the compressive forces of a screw are used to stimulate bone growth between two pieces of bone and connect them into one. The problem we're having is that bone possesses both the properties of a liquid and a solid, causing it to lose compression over time and oftentimes it makes the process ineffective. Now our study wants to continue to explore this interaction and we will be doing this by comparing three different types of screws, a partially threaded screw, a dual threaded screw, and a fully threaded screw in a system in which two cadaver bones will be compressing a load cell, which is a device that can measure force and are then tightened by those respective screws. This process will also maintain two main phases, which is a tightening and resting phase. Those are so we can measure the initial achievement of compression as well as compression over time. Now, as you can see, in sample A, we see that the partial and uh, dual threaded screws achieve similar amounts of compression, but the dual threaded is able to maintain it better. And in sample B, we see that overall, the partial threaded screw is able to achieve a higher amount of compression, but again, struggles to maintain it. And the dual threaded screw is able, uh, achieves less compression than sample A, but maintains it relatively well. In both samples, the full threaded screw is unable to create compression. Now, this study doesn't exactly give us an exact answer on which screw is better, but it does give us insight that maybe the situation around the bone could play a determining factor when choosing. For example, sample B had more porous bone than sample A, meaning that bone porosity could play a determining role in picking medical hardware. Our future goals are to use different types of screws, such as those with internal springs that can provide continuous compression so that we can help account for all the lost compression over time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rosa Navarro and I worked in Dr. Polly's lab and I analyzed the root structures of lettuce plants. Roots are very important when it comes to the health of the plant because it's the way that they get its water and its nutrients. So two variations were taken, Alceriola and Salinas, and they were crossed to produce the offspring. My job was to compare the offspring with the parents to see what specific traits were adopted from the parents. Using computer analysis, it took measurements of a bunch of characteristics, and I specifically worked with area, width, and stem diameter. We then created a graphs using our studios, and I created visual representations of how the offspring compare to the parents. Uh, we could see some clear differences that the offspring tend to be off from the original parents. We then wanted to find markers that related to the specific trait to see and pinpoint what exactly is responsible for the traits. When we have these markers, we can use it to selectively breed the fittest plants to prosper in a drought conditions and water limited environments. So we can continue the production of lettuce. Hi, my name is Ayala Noor, and this summer I worked under Dr. Tyson Lab, where we focus on, on integrating large language models for reproducible research. And particularly, I focus on generic variations and like between different samples to see how how related the human genome is. And the purpose of my research was as the DNA world becomes more popular, there's more research being done, done on European descent than any other group of people. And it kind of becomes problematic as those results could be used for Africans or different types of different human beings who might not be Elsco, who might not be Europeans. And to, to find out how diverse the human genome is, we first had to get a data that we can work with. And I was working with that 1,000 genome data at the phase three, which basically consists of 2,500 samples and from 26 different populations. And the, the way that I was trying to analyze it was the principal components to try to see how related those data was. That data was. And as, as the data, as working with it, with it in a, with a, you know, work could be difficult, so JGBT served as a way to basically make the job way more easier than having to go to different sites to, to figure out which file works on, on, on which does not. As you can see, there's a list of how I got the, the, 
the, the data that I needed. And you can see it takes now one, but many steps. So JGBT made it like made it much easier to get that data. And as you can see, the, the results. The first one explains the first the first principal components of the third and second components which basically shows how related the genome are. So, uh, for example, uh, the agents, uh, we basically collided with the Europeans, while other populations did not collide with anyone except themselves. As you can see, uh, the Africans are still in their position in the, in the second graph, which basically shows the first components that consists most of the, the variants that uh, the, they share, which basically shows the, the true geograph of the data, and the first and the and the and the last and the last graph shows how every group has its own praise and how they're basically all diverse from from one another. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lauren Foff. I'm a key student working with the Meredith Lab. I have been working with the Arizona Board of Regents Tree Performance Project focusing on the Iowa tree species. So we are trying to look at how we can more efficiently water trees in our arid landscape. Arizona has been facing a drought for the last several years and we're looking to more efficiently use water when we're watering trees. The Arizona Board of Regents Tree Performance Project focuses on the establishment of trees. However, these results may have implications going past that stage. So we are looking and testing five different treatments for the trees. Basin, which is a ditch in the ground used to direct water towards the tree. We have cellulose and plastic hydrogels, which are used to absorb water that is in the soil. And from there, it will slowly release back into the soil when needed. The, we are using landscape mulch to trap water in the soil, and we have our conventional control group. In other words, we are going to look at conventional irrigation to so that we have a clear baseline of our results. So far, we found that the mulch works best for trapping the water in the soil. Followed by cellulose, it is the most effective at maintaining soil moisture. Once the study is complete, it will have implications for water usage and it will save water for our urban landscape and for our area ecosystem. Notably, it may also have implications for further research. Some examples of further research may include other applications of our work. For example, we might we'll be looking at agriculture. We might also look at different combinations. For example, since mulch and cellulose both showed promise on their own, how could they be used together and other similar research? Thank you. Hi, my name is Sharice, and this summer I worked in Dr. Michael Brown's lab on rhodopsin. So rhodopsin is a membrane protein located in the retina of the eye. What it does is it detects dim light and alerts the cell of the stimuli. So what we focused on was actually retinal, which is the chromophore of rhodopsin, which is what primarily absorbs the light. So our goal was to use computational methods to observe how the environment around retinal affected its light absorption. We did this by modifying the amount of residues around retinal and also by the presence of water. So first, we went on the protein data bank and downloaded the uh, file for rhodopsin. After that, we isolated retinal and added in residues around it in models of increasing complexity. For example, we had M2, which had two residues, all the way up to M10, which had 10. And after this, we optimized to create the most stable, stable configuration possible, and eventually we calculated the UV visible spectra. So what we did with these UV visible spectra are that the spectra are caused by the excitation of electrons after they, um, after they absorb energy, in this case, light. And what we did is we compared it to the experimental results we had from the um, the wet lab, and after that, we saw how the models we made um, compared to the experimental results. So um, we saw that M6, which had six residues, was a lot less accurate than M10, which had 10, which showed that the more residues we added around, around retinal, the more accurate the model was to the actual um, experimental situation of retinal. We also added and removed water, and we found that M10 with water was more accurate than M10 without water. Eventually, we organized our results into orbital diagrams, which showed us where the light absorbance was primarily located. So we saw that light absorbance was focused on retinal, which matched up with our experimental data because retinal is what 
primarily absorbs the light. So in the future, we're hoping to expand our um, investigation to other forms of uh, other forms of retinal, such as its form after B activation. And we're also hoping that this will improve our understanding of molecular dynamics, which will eventually allow us to um, will allow us to address rhodopsin dysfunction, which causes night blindness in people and um, makes it difficult to impossible for them to see in dim light. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sophie Richard, and I worked in Dr. Sean Lemison's lab studying fetal growth restriction, or FGR. FGR is caused by placental insufficiency, or PI. PI is a condition in which the fetus does not grow to a normal weight during pregnancy due to the placenta being growth restricted. FGR pregnancies increase the risk of perinatal death and are linked to non-insulin dependent diabetes and diseases that present later in life. With FGR pregnancies, glucose stimulated insulin secretion is diminished. So we hypothesized that a treatment consisting of supplementing glucose and oxygen would increase insulin area and thus beta cell area. To do so, I analyzed fetal sheet pancreas sections from three experimental groups. FGR-OG, the treatment FGR group, FGR-AS, the non-treatment FGR group, and control, the non-FGR group. From the data, I concluded that there was no significant statistical difference between any of the groups. However, this could be due to too small of a sample size, outliers, and not enough areas measured. The treatment failed to increase the placenta weight, which suggests that a longer treatment is needed as a 10-day treatment may not be long enough to increase beta cell area. In contrast, the treatment did increase the FGR concentrations of glucose and oxygen closer to the control. For future directions, the lab will be increasing the sample size in hopes to find a statistical difference between the three experimental groups. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sabrina Russell. During my internship, I work in Dr. Espinal's lab. My project was to design a sensor that could detect insulin secretion from a single cell. Looking at previous research, we discovered that this project is actually two projects. To facilitate these two projects, we used a quartz theta capillary that had a filament in the middle to separate two chambers. The first half of the project, we paralyzed half of the pipette to create carbon inside. Paralyzing in our case just means burning gases without oxygen. The carbon acts as an electrode, and using a cyclic voltammetry machine, we can use the electrode to detect redox reactions. In our case, we used the electrode in a ruthenium solution that is redox bound to detect it. This half of the project was working great with all of our electrodes. For the second half of the project, we used the same method using a P2000 pipette polar and pulling it into a pipette. We then, instead of pyrolyzing, we then filled the pipette with PBS buffer. PBS buffer allows for ions to pass through the tip of the pipette and using a scanning ion conductance microscopy, microscopy machine, we were, we were not able to image a 5x5 micrometer standard grid. But using a standard uh, pipette, we were able to image it, as you can see on the right. Further research is to help the parameters of the SICM machine with a double barrel pipette. The pipette will enable us to help study insulin secreting diseases like diabetes better. Thank you. Hi, my name is Arwen Showman, and I worked in Dr. Bannock's physiology lab studying polycystic kidney disease, which is a genetic disorder that causes cysts to form in the kidneys. My project focused on evaluating the effectiveness of the treatment total renal denervation, which is a process that cuts all signal between the kidneys and the brain. I evaluated this by measuring two things in vertebrates, both with and without the treatment. First, I measured the cystic area inside the kidneys, and second, I measured the amount of fibrotic tissue or scar tissue inside the glomeruli of each kidney, which are vessels that filter blood. Through these two measurements, I was able to determine the extent of the effect that polycystic kidney disease had on each vertebrate, and thus determined if the treatment total renal denervation actually worked. My results showed that overall, the vertebrates that were treated had a lower cystic area and less glomerular fibrosis than the vertebrates without any treatment. This suggests that 
total renal denervation does limit the effect of polycystic kidney disease. However, there is currently no test to determine patients that would benefit from this treatment, so further investigation needs to be done to apply this in a clinical setting. For future directions of my project, I would likely study afferent renal denervation, which would only cut signal from the kidney to the brain instead of all signal like total renal denervation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Narik Thompson and I work in Dr. Ravi Shankar's lab in microbiology. Foodborne pathogens cause illnesses around the world every year. Food industries use chemical sanitizer to clean their food. However, consumers would prefer a more natural way of cleaning their food. We work with plant-based antimicrobials like seaweed extract, hibiscus extract, and grapeseed extract against pathogens such as salmonella and listeria. For experiment, we use test tubes to create cultures of salmonella and listeria mixed with antimicrobials and incubated them overnight. For our graph of salmonella, seaweed 5% and 2.5% had a reduction rate of nine to seven. For grapeseed 5% and 2.5%, it had a reduction rate of seven to two, while hibiscus had a reduction rate of 8.1 to 3.4. For Listeria's graph, the reduction rate was higher than Salmonella. Seaweed had a reduction rate of 9.5 to seven, making it the highest on both graphs. For grapeseed, the reduction rate was 6.5 to 5.4, while hibiscus had a reduction rate of 6.1 to 0.5. Seaweed is fairly new to food industries. With our findings, we can help food industries kill pathogens more efficiently than using chemical sanitizers a more natural way. Hello, my name is Christopher Angaro, and I was a Keith intern at Dr. Ty Kong's Conus Matter Physics Lab this past summer. Uh, his lab primarily focuses on the synthesis and characterization of novel materials, specifically electromagnetically novel materials. Uh, but my research was regarding the, one, the singular magnetic state known as geometric frustration. In a typical magnetic structure inside of a compound structure, you will have basically two magnetic molecules or moments aligning anti-parallelly to each other. So they're both facing opposite directions, but they're aligned along the same axis. In geometric frustration, however, the state I thought, one magnetic moment attem attempts to simultaneously align itself with two neighbors, both of which are facing opposite directions inside a triangular structure. Of course, it can't simultaneously exist in two orientations at once. It can't simultaneously basically satisfy the magnetic needs of both of those neighbors. So it becomes unstable and it will fluctuate between those two states. We try to synthesize this unique state within five different compounds listed there, uh, including calcium, nickel-2, zinc-3, whose structure is depicted here. And to actually create those states, we effectively took their elemental constituents, uh, mixed them together within a then vacuum-sealed tube, and heated those tubules to somewhere between 850 to 1,000 degrees Celsius, depending on the desired end target compound. Uh, afterwards, we took the, those heated and, complete, and fully synthesized samples and we ground them and performed an XRD scan on them. Uh, during XRD, every single compound, every single material in the universe during an XRD scan will have its own unique series of basically angles of incidence at which the most energy will be diffracted from the original beam to the sensor. Uh, thus, you can basically, by analyzing the specific peaks at various angles of each material, determine what a substance is. Sadly, for our created materials, our samples, uh, our series of peaks were not at all those that were associated with our target compounds. Um, primarily, we ended up actually creating binary phases of just two of the three elemental components. Uh, for calcium, nickel-2, zinc-3, for example, whose results are depicted here, uh, we primarily produced uh, pure zinc and nickel zinc by binary compounds. Uh, despite this failure, more research should be pursued in this area uh, through new synthesis attempts of these compounds and other compounds, because if geometric, a geometrically frustrated state can be discovered and then eventually leveraged, it could allow for new electromagnetically novel materials for manufacturing. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Avery Shalom Valencia, and this summer I worked under Dr. Alicia Allen in the Renew Lab, where I analyzed data from the ORCID study to increase participant satisfaction among postpartum women with OUD, or opioid use disorder, in research studies. The ORCID study investigates the correlation between opioid use, hormone fluctuation, and caregiving activity within postpartum participants. Participant satisfaction is heavily significant in research studies because it allows for increased retention and produces reliable results, which aid the target population. In my research, the target population was postpartum mothers with OUD, who are less likely to participate in research studies due to stigma surrounding addiction and legal issues concerning the Department of Child Services or jail time. This means that research on mothers with OUD is underdeveloped, despite being an at-risk population and needing increasingly effective treatment. To alleviate this, I analyzed data from participant satisfaction survey responses from week 12 of the ORCID study to identify significant participation factors and increase retention, reliability, and research conduction among mothers with OUD. To do this, I quantitatively coded participants' sociodemographics, opioid usage, and compared survey responses between participants with and without OUD, while I quantitatively analyzed participant responses, negative or positive, concerning their satisfaction in the study. My results showed that participants were satisfied with compensation, daily surveys, and their relations with staff, while they were dissatisfied with blood withdrawal, um, restrictions prior to visit, and um, guilt from leaving the study early. My results also showed that there was more participation burden among participants with OUD than without OUD. If these participation factors are applied to future research findings, it will improve the retention and satisfaction of participants, which will contribute to future research findings on mothers with OUD and help aid this at-risk population. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shreva Nvungatur, and this summer I entered at Dr. Sandhu's optical physics lab. Dr. Sandhu's lab focuses on ultrafast spectroscopy, which focuses on imaging and capturing the movement of an electron. Although cameras can capture really fast processes such as a bullet, these occur only in millisecond timescales. Therefore, they are far too slow for the ultrafast processes such as the movement of an electron or electron dynamics that occur on at a second time scales, which is a billionth of a billionth of a second, or 10 to the negative 18th, which is 15 orders faster than a millisecond. A camera's electromechanical shutters are far too slow for this. Instead, scientists use high energy pulse lasers to try to image these processes. To generate short pulses, a large spectrum of colors is needed. This is due to quantum mechanical effects and mathematical effects as well, such as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and Fourier transforms. Generating these short pulses is important as it compresses the pulse temporally, creating a shorter pulse that can then be used to image these uh, ultra-fast processes. To do this, we use a nonlinear effect called self-phase modulation, which creates a large spectrum of colors. This summer, my project was comparing two methods at spectrally broadening a pulse. One a hollow core fiber setup, and two, a quartz multi-plate setup. The main goal of both of these setups was to compress a 200 femtosecond pulse to four femtoseconds from a euterbium laser. Analyzing the data from both of these setups through a spectrometer showed that the hollow core fiber setup filled with xenon gas produced a much larger spectral broadening, whereas the quartz plate setup produced minimal spectral broadening. Even though the hollow core fiber setup was very hard to set up and takes multiple days to set up and be used properly and efficiently, whereas the quartz setup can take a matter of a couple hours to set up for it properly. In the future, our lab wants to change the thickness and the materials of the plates and the distances between the plates to create more spectral broadening within these plates. If this is deemed successful, then using the plates can deem Eterbium lasers to be used for ultra-fast spectroscopy. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zachary Wang, and I spent my summer with the Gutruff Lab, which focuses on the research, development, and testing of biosymbiotic devices. These are wireless implantable electronics that can coexist with the body and unintrusively monitor its health. Uh, however, these devices must withstand the hostile environment of the human body. This might be bodily fluids, pH levels, movement, or biofouling, which is the accumulation of bacteria or proteins on, this, on a foreign surface. My project focused on the impact of physical and chemical stress on the encapsulation material, PDMS, which mutually protects the device from its environment. 
uh, by subjecting a dummy mold made of PDMS to cyclical uh, mechanical strain through the use of a stretching stage, as you can see on the left, um, I could observe its accelerated lifespan. The platform records the stress data of the dummy for me to analyze, and by periodically stretching the material for several days, I could evaluate its chronic durability. I plotted a sinusoidal wave with the raw data, which basically visually uh, conveys the incremental strain and release of the device over time. I uh, then also isolated the maximum and minimum points of stress, uh, in other words, the peaks, and the, the peaks and the dips of the sinusoidal wave, and plotted them out as well. The consistency of the stress, um, as depicted by the steady horizontal lines on the graph to the right, gives us a good idea that the mechanical components of the stretching stage and the mechanical durability of the PDMS are suitable for long-term use. In research, this can mean that wireless implantable devices encapsulated with PDMS can eliminate the need for uh, physical tethers or bulky equipment. In day-to-day uh, -day life, the, P the material's uh, durability can minimize the need for regular assessments or maintenance, ensuring peace of mind and saving lives by preserving optimal data de device performance. Hello, my name is Jake Weiss, and this summer I worked in Dr. LaFleur's biostatistics lab, where we identified biomarkers that are associated with the early stages of cognitive decline. Now, as the brain ages, there are distinct metabolic signals we can pick up on that tell us about the progression of cognitive decline years before permanent memory loss has occurred. To look at the relationship between the brain and metabolism, we use the ADNEED dataset, which tracks the progression of Alzheimer's disease over time. Now, we look at two groups of individuals within this data set, those who are at normal cognition for all of a four-year period, and those who start at normal cognition but develop mild cognitive impairment at some point in those four years. The goal in our analysis is to distinguish between these two groups using a machine learning tool called Random Forest. We give the Random Forest our metabolite concentrations, and it gives us a prediction for whether someone is going to fall into the cognitively normal group or the mild cognitive impairment group. It then also gives us a measure of variable importance, which is to say, how important is each metabolite in making that distinction between our two groups? High variable importance means it's a potential biomarker. In males, we identified a diglyceride and triglyceride as potential biomarkers, while in females, we identified lysophosphatidylcholines. Each of these has been previously linked to Alzheimer's disease in some manner, and this research suggests they could show up even earlier in the progression of cognitive decline. In a preclinical setting, we hope these biomarkers can be used to provide quicker diagnoses and more personalized treatment options, such as therapies and simple lifestyle changes that can benefit the cognitive health of all people. Thank you.